Hello and welcome to this, the 100 most popular cars ever. You, the men and motors viewers, have voted in your tens of thousands for this definitive list. And during the course of our five programmes, we're going to speak to a whole host of motoring experts, to celebrities, but most important of all, to you at home. Today, we'll be taking a look at the cars which scrapped and clawed their way into our chart from 100 to 81. But first, to get us all in the mood, here are some well-known faces telling us about their favourite cars. My favourite car would have to be the Ferrari, um, the Death Bridge. It has to be my car, an Audi TT. It's a Porsche 911, Targa, Silver. So on now with the vote proper, and we're going to start rather originally at number 100 with the Big Healy, which may sound like a jazz band with Sammy J on sax and Eliza Jones as guest vocalist, but was in fact the nickname given to a whole series of cars made by that seminal British manufacturer, Austin Healy, the last of which was the 3000. The partnership that resulted in the name Austin Healy was comprised of Donald Mitchell Healy, who designed the cars, and Austin, who built them. But it's the 3000 which is the best known of the big Heelys. It debuted in 1959 and featured a new six-cylinder 2,912cc engine rated at 124 brake horsepower. The Austin Healey 3000 was always referred to as a hairy-chested sports car and I think, funnily enough, that's a description that actually suited it. Um, uh, absurdly long bonnet, a big three-litre six engine, very heavy to drive, heavy clutch, heavy brakes, heavy throttle, very heavy steering, no ground clearance at all. Being such an iconic British sports car, it wasn't long before the 3000 was exported overseas. The trouble was though, this brought as many problems as it did solutions. America was Austin Healey's biggest market. They were like shelling peas over there, but then they got involved, their emission laws changed, the crash zones changed. You can't run into a pedestrian with this size bumper. You've got to, uh, and it basically made the car too expensive to produce. And in '68, they they had to stop uh, stop selling it in the states. It secured its place in history as one of the formative British sports car, and as such, it thoroughly deserves its place in our top 100. Now, the car at number 99 couldn't be more different. One of the few things in the world that uses its behind better than Kylie. Launched in 1995 amidst the flurry of Gallic passion, the Renault Megane was the big sister to Nicole's Clio. Good looking car, they do a coupe, they do a saloon, they do the scenic, the people carrier. Um, great range of diesel engines, um, comfortable, um, just a good all round inoffensive kind of car. Say to me Renault Megane and this is my reaction. Do you know what I mean? Oh dear. You see, the trouble with the Megane wasn't that there was anything really wrong with it, there just wasn't anything right with it either. It had an image problem. Renault set about rectifying this with the new Megane. With an all new shape, best in its class safety and stronger image, the new Megane was designed to take on the Focus, the Astra, and even the mighty Golf. How did it fare? The new Megane, old Megane, not a lot in it. Oh dear, it seems our experts weren't taken in by the Megane's cute behind, but thousands of you were, and the new Megane is selling far better than the old one ever did, which is good enough for it to be in 99th position. Different cars are voted onto this list for different reasons. Some are voted in for being revolutionary, for changing the way that we think about cars. Some are voted in because they're beautiful works of art. Others for managing to bring the thrill of driving to the masses. Our next car, though, managed to do none of these. I cannot conceive how the Vauxhall Cavalier has made it onto your list. Um, it's a totally boring car, and that's all I've got to say about it. People are now starting to react and take notice of it because they are disappearing. It's not a car that you're starting to see every day now. Middle class, middle income families wanted the freedom and prestige a car would provide and the Cavalier suited that need perfectly. It was affordable and practical. Most people who drive Cavaliers and now Vectras are up and down the motorway who need it just to cover 25,000 miles a year and not miss a beat are quite happy with them. So clearly an awful lot of you think the Cavalier is a fantastic example of practical, value for money, no-nonsense motoring, and who are we to argue? It deserves its place in the chart, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Now here is an iconic car that this chart really would not be complete without. 
Next on our list is a British-made car that once held the title of the world's best-selling sports car. In at number 97 is the MGB. The MGB is a real icon of British motoring. It's one of those kind of really exciting small sports cars that people are always going to have mass massive affection for. The MGB was launched at Earl's Court Motor Show on the 20th of September 1962 as a successor to the MGA. I think what appeals to me about an MG is the fact that it's British and the MG name is synonymous with sports cars and racing uh, with this country since the 1920s. So there's a kind of throwback and a heritage to it. The MGB proved a worthy successor. It was a sports car that provided improved comfort and versatility without alienating the traditional sports car customer who favoured the MG image. The MGB's had a fair few rivals over its long production history, you know, cars like the Austin Healey. But I think the MG's always come out on top because it's fun, it's small, it's easy to modify and people have real affection for it. Well, driving the car is a strange experience. Uh, you've got to understand there's no power steering or ABS uh, or any of the high-tech systems that we're used to today. When production ended in 1980, more than half a million MGBs had been made. The British public had been bowled over by this cute roadster and even the Americans got to sample it too. The MGB is one of probably Britain's favourite small sports cars. It's one of those cars that's always going to be iconic, that people are always going to have massive affection for. The MGB was a British sports car of great charm and quality, an image it retained throughout its extended production life. So for its British heritage and longevity, it deserves to be in the top 100. I don't care what anybody says, I love that car. I voted for it, oh, at least a hundred times. Now it goes without saying that timing is absolutely key when it comes to the success of a new vehicle. And that was never more the case than with a car at number 96, the Ferrari Testarossa. I'd heard people refer to it as the Ferrari Testosterone. They, you know, it sounded like that. My missus still thinks it's called a Testosterone. It's true that the time the Testarossa was king is not the most popular in many people's minds, and that the Testarossa carries something of a negative image because of that. We took one in part exchange, and uh, I had to move it around the car park. We had two rows of cars, so we had more parked up here, more parked up there, and I was trundling down this white Testarossa with red leather interior. And um, I got level with the car wash, and there was a sort of water all over the car park, and I gave it just a little bit of throttle. Suddenly the back end stuck out, and the car literally went sideways, and I had like six inches in front of the front bumper, six inches behind the back bumper. It was like, you know in that Austin Powers thing where you get stuck in the corridor in the golf trolley? That was me. I was going, Arr! Arr! After about 10 minutes, I got out, hand the key to the van, I said, I just want to like, move that, mate, you know. It, I mean, there's no headroom, um, the visibility is appalling, it's starting to look dated, but it sounds wonderful, and it, it was an icon of its time. But really, you drive one now, and you do feel a bit Rod Stewart. Image aside, the Testarossa was one of Ferrari's finest moments. Pininfarina's design is instantly recognisable from any angle. Side on, the engine cooling vents cut deep into the side sill, distinguish it from any other car. From the back, the slats are continued, running the full width of the car. See one in your rear view mirror, and its narrow front and wide back profile is instantly intimidating. Testarossa was a total embodiment of 1980s extravagance, flamboyance and style. Those that are in the know will still hopefully regard it as one of the finest V12 Ferraris there was. Um, it just didn't have a near side rear view mirror. Almost to prove how of its time it was, the Testarossa was feeling outdated and outpaced by the end of the 1980s. The reign of rolled up sports jackets, new romantics and white Testarossas was definitely over. Well personally speaking, I'm glad the era of prancing around in white linen suits has gone forever, but what a great car. Now, here's an original line for you, time for something completely different. Cars that are fun to drive normally come in three categories. Those that handle well, those that are phenomenally quick, and those that are none of the above, but do put a smile on your face. So what category do you think the Citroen 2CV is in? The original design brief was that you should be able to wear a top hat um, with a basket of eggs on the back seat and drive across a ploughed field with none of the eggs breaking. Um, and it, and it, 
you know, it did it. <laughs> There's an amazing piece of film to show them actually proving the point. When it was designed, the 2CV had to fulfill all of the following needs. It would allow two peasants to drive 100 kilograms of farm goods to market at 60 kilometers an hour in clogs and across muddy, unpaved roads. It would use no more than three liters of petrol to travel 100 kilometers. And most famously, it would be able to drive across a ploughed field without breaking the eggs it was carrying. And the designers also raised the roof to allow the driver to wear a hat. I like the shape of it and the fact that you can drive around corners and make uh, other drivers' faces smile and laugh as they look at you almost fall over in the car. I think what attracted me most was having backed our previous car into the gatepost. I was told that by using one spanner, my husband could take the wings off when I did it the next time. And we have great fun in it. I have a daughter who'd got one and I just absolutely fell in love with it. You can roll the roof down and it's lovely in the summer. The 2CV stayed in production for an amazing 42 years, second only to the VW Beetle. It was responsible for building France, for mobilising two generations and must go down as one of the most influential cars ever. One of my mates got one just after he passed his driving test and it was the most fun we've ever had in a car. For a start, it'd be like, you change gear, all right then, you know, this ridiculous gear lever coming out of the dashboard. People in the back could do it. John, your turn, third to fourth, please, okay. He'd lean over, change the gears from the back of the car. It was that much fun. Braking, that was a collective effort. We'd all have to try and put our feet on the brakes in time to stop before the lollipop lady, because we'd get in trouble. No, the, the 2CV, it's, it, it's a historic car, you know, it's an icon. Fun's the word. Get yourself a 2CV. Well, the 2CV thoroughly deserves its place in our top 100, and it seems you at home love your French cars, and so it's with a small amount of British despair that we move on to our next car. The year is 1993, not a time when your average hatchback driver could feel very inspired. Volkswagen's latest Golf is the worthy but plain Mark III, and Ford's offering the Escort is nothing to write home about. But then, Peugeot unveil the new 306. Peugeot was buoyed by the 205 and how successful and how much fun it was to drive on the road. Um, and when the 306 came out, it was just an improvement. It was just even better. Initially, it was only available as a hatchback, but through its life, the 306 family spawned a saloon, an estate, and a rather pretty convertible styled by the Italian design house Pininfarina. For years, Peugeot had the little hatch market sewn up with the 306 because there was nothing really to come anywhere close. Um, and that was until, I'd say, the Ford Focus came out. You could have your 306 with a number of engines. The two that really stand out today are the sporty S16 with its six-speed gearbox and 160 brake horsepower. This was a rapid hot hatch years before the Honda Civic Type R. And the French just love their diesels. The 306 turbo diesel was a winner with GTI overtaking ability and excellent economy. First thing you'll probably hear is uh, the exhaust and maybe the filter. And it tends to turn heads and when they see the big wheels spinning under, under low arches, then just probably seem to think that's a nice car. The 306 was made for almost eight years. When production finished in 2001, almost three million had been produced. There is a certain longevity of a product and um, I think Ford has now really stolen the mantle of the, of the fun, good driving hatch from Peugeot with the demise of the 306. So the arrival of the Peugeot 306 made 1993 a year to remember for hatchback fans. The car is still popular with tuners and penny-pinching diesel misers today, making it a worthy member of your most popular cars. Well, that's just about the end of part one. Let's see the cars you voted for so far. So we're fast approaching the end of part one, but before we go, let's have a look back at the cars in the chart so far. In at 100, a true British sports car, the Austin Healey 3000. In at 99, 
the Renault Megane. At 98, a surprising entry in the shape of the Vauxhall Cavalier. At 97, one of the most iconic British sports cars ever, the MGB. Sitting in 96th place, the Ferrari Testarossa. In at 95, truly a car that changed the world, the Citroen 2CV. And the last car in this part, at 94, is the Peugeot 306. Well, that's it from part one, but obviously, you know, there are thousands of cars that you didn't vote for. So let's tease you with one of those now. It's French, it's small, and it was a bestseller in its class. What is it? I'll tell you after the break. So welcome back. And the clues before the break were it was French and it was small and it was a bestseller and it was the Citroen Saxa. But let's return now to the cars that you did vote for, although we're staying with the French theme. And here's a car that is constantly reinventing itself and yet to this day remains fresh looking, young and vibrant. Launched in 1991 to replace the Super 5, the Clio broke through the numerical system of calling new cars and opened an era of personal names. I think the Renault Clio appeals to people that like small, nippy, speedy cars, but also people that want to see a bit different. You know, these people aren't people that are going to go and buy a Golf. With its French styling, average price and diminutive dimensions, the Clio was a car about town way before the likes of Corsa and Saxo got in on the act. Imagine sitting down in the pub. Right, mates, lads, girls, get a list, your 100 best cars ever. If there were girls there, they'd have the Clio in it. Crikey O'Reilly, chick's car if ever there was one. With prices starting at just £7,000, this has become one of its best-selling points. But drivers wanting some extra va va -voom can fork out just over 27000 for the V6 255 version. But it's one of those that can be all sorts of things to different people. I mean, it's had great success on the track. You can buy body-kitted, spoiled versions. But also, it's a great car if you just want to get it from A to B. For as long as the Clio is brought across to our shores, it will remain one of the most popular cars ever. A question for you. What on earth is the point of making a car that goes at 200 miles an hour? And the answer? Because Porsche make the Carrera GT. And even if you never got it out of second gear, you'd still feel you were driving the car of the gods. You would bow to its carbon fiber chassis, point your prayer mat in the direction of its 604 brake horsepower V10 engine, nail yourself to its ceramic clutch and lie prostrate in front of its muscular supercar form. Well, you might. But what you would definitely do is talk very nicely to your bank manager and explain why you have spent £330,000 on a car. Imagine buying one of those at Yes Car Finance or one of those. Have you been refused credit? Or do you want a Porsche GT? We can arrange it. Um, oh man, £330,000. grand. Like I say, you've got to be able to afford to crash it to drive it. The supercar market is one of the most hotly contested of all. Currently, the Mercedes McLaren SLR, the Ferrari Enzo and the Porsche are all vying for your half million pound checks. But not everybody is convinced. Bonkers, mad, ridiculous, sensational if you can afford to own them. Um, but the amount of money you're talking about, you know, paying for them. Um, when, let's face it, the only time you're ever going to get to drive them as they are designed and intended is on a track. Well, bonkers they may be, but by the time you've realised you've paid an inordinate amount of money for a car that you can't really use, you'll be doing 200 miles an hour and you won't even care. And that's the whole point of cars like this. They don't fulfil any new marketing niche, they don't answer age-old problems, and they're not exactly suited to today's motoring environment. They do, however, provide the raw, visceral thrill of speed. And that's good enough for me, and obviously for you too, because it's at number 92. Some of the cars in our list hold a special place in the hearts of our experts, and it's gratifying to see that you've managed to warm the hearts of grown men with your votes. Witness, please, Brendan Coogan, reliving the simple joys of a toy car, and not just any toy car but the Datsun 240Z. Heritage of Z cars means everything. I had little Matchbox 340ZX cars, uh, 360Z, they were a disappointment. The 340 was probably the best one. 
Um, they were sensational cars. Obviously, I never drove one. They were before my time, but they were the cars that, you know, I, I, they made the biggest noise and went fastest when I was going around the carpet with them, you know. What is it they say? Boys don't grow up, their toys just get bigger. So if Brendan was to push a toy car around his carpet now, the one that made the biggest noise and went the fastest would be this, the 350Z. But how does it compare in the real world? I drove one recently and I have to say it wasn't a disappointment. It was sensational. I think uh, the styling is aggressive, it's contemporary, um, it's a bite your legs off kind of car. If you drive lots of cars, you know, I'm lucky enough to drive lots of cars, so you get them delivered or you pick them up or whatever and you get in the car, the measure of it is, is not sometimes what you think of it, but how people react to you. Um, and when the 350Z turned up, the reaction from friends and they, they came over and they were poking around. Small children were going, can I sit in it? Um, and they wanted to look at the engine, this kind of thing. And then you realise this is something really quite special. Because it's not the most expensive car I've had sat on the drive, but it's probably, um, it's probably the car that turned more heads, which kind of surprised me a little bit. It's not surprising the 350Z impressed our experts. The 3.5 V6 producing 287 brake horsepower and looks that in some way hark back to the 240s whilst looking thoroughly modern at the same time make the 350Z a seductive car. It has also managed, along with other cars in this class, to refresh the coupe market. What you get with the 350Z is a ground up coupe. Um, whether it's reinvigorated it or not, I'm not sure. I don't think it was in need of reinvigorating because coupes, you know, were dying a death 20 years ago. And uh, now, you know, I'll bet every third or fourth car's a coupe. Managing to combine heritage with a thoroughly modern design is always a tough challenge, but it's one that Nissan have achieved with the 350Z. And judging by the reaction the cars received, they'll be doing so again in the future, drawing upon the 350Z as their inspiration. And so we find ourselves at number 90. Now this list does contain a few of the usual suspects that men of a certain vintage would choose. But this one is the car of the discerning gentleman, the thinking man's 60s GT. The Jensen Interceptor was launched in 1966 at the Earl's Court Motor Show after an earlier version launched in 1950 had failed to inspire the British public. The holy trinity of 60s motoring was thus formed. Italian design, American power, British engineering. The Jensen Intercept launched at about the same time as the DB6 in the U-Type and it was a similar looking car. It had that long sweeping bonnet, that short end, the real signs of a performance car. For me though, the Jensen Intercept was the better looking of the three. It had that fantastic curved rear screen and the styling was more brutal, it looked more aggressive, slightly more American. 600 Interceptors a year came out of Birmingham, virtually straight from launch. And whilst many areas remained unchanged, the Jensen did make some amazing technological advances. Uh, Jensen's were one of the first companies to introduce many uh, new features to, to their vehicles. They were one of the first cars to fit seat belts as standard. They were one of the first cars with disc brakes. Um, they also had ABS and uh, other models had four-wheel drive. In its day, as a point-and-squirt kind of vehicle, get round the bend, give it some, and it would just rip up the straights. I mean, huge amounts of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good handling car, and the four-wheel the four drive was very, very impressive. But despite any technological advances, it was the Mopar V8, the heart of the Interceptor, that caused its demise in 1976. Fuel consumption of 10 miles to the gallon was fine in the hedonistic 60s, but by 74 and the fuel crisis, it forced a slump in sales that Jensen simply couldn't recover from. A sad end for an often forgotten piece of British 60s sports car royalty. God bless the Jensen Interceptor and all who rode in her. Now, you know, history tends to show that cars which get designed by accident fade from the memory very quickly indeed, but that's not the case with this particular car. The Stag was never designed to meet a carefully researched market need. It only happened at all because stylist Giovanni Michelotti had strong links with Triumph and wanted something to show off his styling skills at the 1965 Turin Motor Show. By mid-1970, the Stag was on public sale using Triumph's new 3-litre V8, later changed to Rover's V8, and the distinctive rollover bar to solve the problem of rigidity with the monocoque shell. 
I'm not sure that um, when the stag was launched that Triumph had a clear idea of their primary target. I think they were looking at um, the 45 baby boomers before they'd boomed. And, uh, um, uh, and that's me. Um, you know, they were looking at my generation to buy the stag before we'd made the money that we needed to buy the stag. In 1973, the stag was revised with no major changes made. Customers now got a hard top as standard, as well as the removable soft top, and the car also received some subtle styling tweaks. It shouldn't have been seen as a sports car. It was more a, a touring car. Um, that Triumph V8 engine had a lot of problems. Um, it, it was a bit unreliable, to be honest, um, and it was very intolerant of getting too hot. If it got hot, the heads warped, um, the water got into the oil and you were in big problems. And once it had gone wrong, it was very, very difficult to make it work again. As a result of rather dubious build quality, only 25,000 stags were built in its seven year period. It still remains though, a popular and desirable classic car, owing to its relative rarity and modern features such as power steering, aircon and electric windows. Some open top sports cars don't even have them today. The Triumph Stag, what a fantastic car. Now next, at number 88, we have a car from a nation that until a few years ago, wouldn't have got within a country mile of a chart like this. Several years ago, you wouldn't have thought the manufacturer of the boxy Stella or Pony had curves like this in them. The Hyundai Coupe marked a change in attitudes towards Korean cars. They weren't just gizmo-packed bargain boxes, they could appeal to the heart as well. For Hyundai, it was a real transformation because it broke the mould of the very dowdy, very uh, sort of granny type of styling into something that actually did look very good. Launched back in 1996, the original coupe was well received by the press and immediately Hyundai had something of a hit on their hands. But in the UK at least, the car would have to work hard to beat off the stigma of that badge. It has really scored major points in the, in the sort of die-hard badge category um, because it has been able to break out of that. Coupes have often been talked about as looking good rather than driving fast. Hyundai tapped into that perfectly. And although they made sporty 2.0-litre F2 Evolution models, they also made cheaper but still desirable 1.6-litre models. When they facelifted it, it, um, it became very angular, almost shark-like, and I think that probably put a number of buyers off. But in 2001, they got it right again with the second-generation coupe. So the Hyundai coupe turns out to be a fine contender in our top 100, and it's back to the UK we go now with the Lotus Elan at number 87. Lotus has always been a company that liked to do things its own way, with a knack for building lightweight, basic sports cars with brilliant handling. They look to build upon their success of the seven. The original one, the shocking thing about that is when you get close to it, it's tiny. It's so small, it's so light. It goes back to the original Chapman idea of a small car, a light car, a small engine, goes like stink, handles fantastically. Um, a very delicate thing when you look at it. You, you want to sort of pick it up and cuddle it. It was a trendsetter, a true classic open top roadster. And with a twin cam, 1,558cc engine, four wheel disc brakes and four wheel independent suspension, the car offered incredible road holding. It's a dream to drive. It's light, it hugs the ground, it's fast, it goes round corners at the rate of knots. It's just, it's just heavenly to drive. It was aimed at people that wanted a proper sports car um, but didn't want to wear a flat cap and drive an MG. The Elan still has a dedicated following from people who appreciate its combination of style, technology, great handling and relative low cost. And you obviously still rate it because you've made it number 87. So the Lotus Elan brings us to the end of part two. Let's see what else you've been voting for. At 93, the ever fresh-faced Renault Clio. In 92nd spot, the Porsche Carrera GT. 91st in our chart is the latest of Nissan's Z cars, the 350Z. In 90th, the 60s Gent, the Jensen Interceptor. 
At number 89, the Triumph Stag. At 88 in our top 100, the Korean upstart, the Hyundai Coupe. And at 87, as we've just seen, the Lotus Elan. Well, it's time for a break now, but while we're away, have a think on this. Another car that you didn't vote for. It's German and was probably the first ever people carrier. What was it? We'll let you know in a sec. Hello, back again, and the answer to our little tease before the break. There's one parked in your street at this very moment, probably, a VW campervan. OK, back to the chart now, and moving on up, we find ourselves at number 86. The Ford Mustang may be the highlight of the greatest car chase of all time, but what people forget is that Steve McQueen was actually chasing a Dodge Charger. That Charger, what a 428 um, V8, big American muscle car engine in it. And the performance on those things, it was about six seconds to 60, which is kind of BMW M5 tackle now. Uh, probably no brakes and, uh, you know, or anything else, but you don't worry about things like that. Or perhaps it could be General Lee from the Dukes of Hazard that spurs your love for the Charger. The other interesting thing about when they filmed that, uh, that chase scene, as well as hitting quite a few of the cameras on the way, was I think they broke seven or eight Mustangs during the shoot, and they used the same Dodge Charger all the way throughout, which just shows you know, what a, a great true muscle car that it was. Ferraris are a popular sight in our top 100. Their combination of power, performance and image means they're a regular choice for voters, and a favourite amongst them is the 355. The big thing about the 355 was that it was so easy to drive, it was so well screwed together, and it really did herald a new era in Ferrari as being a car that, whilst not quite a Porsche that you could use every day, was kind of getting there. And I think that's the great virtue of the 355. It's a usable Ferrari. Launched in 1994 as the replacement for the 348, the 355 was to become not only one of the most usable Ferraris of all time, but also one of the best. Well, they get a good reaction out of people when they see the car. Um, you get a lot of smiles. Um, people shouting Ferrari, you know, that sort of thing. Visually, the 355 is perhaps the modern day version of the Sistine Chapel. It's sleek, elegant, beautiful, and just about the sexiest thing you've ever seen. The car's very easy to drive. It's uh, power steering. The gears, it's got a six-speed gearbox. It takes a bit of getting, getting used to, but once you master it, it's very easy. Despite looking similar to its predecessor, the 355 couldn't have been any more different. The biggest improvement was the car's handling, an integral ingredient for any sports car. 345 is uh, a great track car. Um, it's, it's easy to modify, easy to upgrade. You can drive to the circuit, you can black around the circuit as long as you don't stuff it, you can drive home in it. Um, competitive racing, lots of people have got them. You know, if you want to get into racing something quite, uh, quite pokey and something you can use on the weekend as well, yeah, a great car. If you've been in the market for a new 355 at launch, it would have set you back around £83,000 or even as much as £110,000. Now, though, you can pick up a good example 355 for just under 52000 and a Spyder for 63. And you can rest assured that's not the last Ferrari you're going to see in this series or indeed in this episode. As we move on to a car that began life as a Lotus and for many of you ended up being the vehicle that gave you the most fun you've ever had on four wheels. Designed by Colin Chapman and launched by Lotus at the 1957 Earl's Court Motor Show, the Lotus 7 was, surprisingly enough, the successor to the Lotus 6. Two further editions were produced until the early 70s, when sales had dwindled to such a pitch that Lotus ceased production. The car wasn't lost, though. In 1973, Caterham cars took over all the remaining seven parts, jigs, moulds, and most importantly, the manufacturing rights from Lotus. It was a car that was idiosyncratic in the extreme. It was a car for um, eccentrics. Uh, you know, who would ever drive one except A on the track or B, some handlebar mustachioed nutter in the home counties, which, you know, you didn't get a lot of those in North Manchester in the 70s. The Caterham has continued almost unchanged cosmetically and technically since leaving Lotus. It has, however, appealed to a different audience. When you put your foot down, 
You don't even have to go very fast, but you feel like you're traveling. And I come back with a grin on my face. If I was, um, what's he called, Chris Rea? If I was Chris Rea and I had track days out or I was in Pink Floyd, yeah, I'd buy one because they are, you know, a boy's toy. They're the ultimate go-kart. Um, you can go around tracks in them very, very quickly, you know. The fact that they haven't got heaters and doors is neither here nor there. So the Caterham 7 is proof, if ever it was needed, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. A design that's almost unchanged in its 50-year history, and it's as good today as it ever was. Cheaper than therapy. That's it. Next up is a car that comes from an Italian heritage that's unique in the world. Named after the company founder, this car, developed with the help of a certain Michael Schumacher, is aimed to be the closest thing to an F1 drive, and its name is the Ferrari Enzo. It's like a Formula One car again with a, a body around it. I've uh, been at the test track and seen uh, one of their test drivers um, driving it just like a Formula One car, and it's got the technology, it's got the, all the latest uh, Formula One gear changing, the launch control, you name it. Um, why? The much hyped and long awaited Enzo was officially launched on the 26th of September 2002 at the Paris Motor Show as a successor to the F50. With a 217.5 mile an hour top speed and 0 to 62 in 3.65 seconds, this is the fastest road car Ferrari have ever produced. The acceleration of the car is phenomenal, the traction control sorts it out and as long as you're in a dry um, situation with um, high gears, the car is fantastic. Low gears, it's trying to break away and wheel spin all the time. But trying to put 650 horsepower down through two little bits of rubber isn't the easiest thing. This ultra-wide, predatory-looking supercar is sure to have its fans, but with only 349 being made, and at a cost of, wait for it, £420,000, this car to rival the McLaren F1, or even McLaren's latest offering, the SLR, won't appear that frequently on British roads. Arbiter of a car's price is what the market will pay. And if there are um, many more millionaires out there who are happy to pay those sort of prices for cars, you can bet your sweet life the marketing people are going to put them out at those sort of prices. Now, it doesn't actually bear too much relation to what it's cost the factory to make them. So, so don't lose sight of the fact that uh, in paying huge amounts of money for a Ferrari, you're paying for, for heritage and for appeal and, uh, and, uh, and what it says about you, the driver. Despite its hefty price tag, not everything is up to such a high standard. With manual window winders and no stereo, that's a bit of a disappointment. But then, who needs music when you've got a Ferrari engine note to listen to? Kids usually drop to their knees and worship you. Um, a lot of thumbs up. And uh, women, for once, will actually stop and let you add in traffic, which is remarkable. Enzo's, Schmenzo's, I'm not. It doesn't say anything to me. It's not a car that I'm going to have a picture of on my wall. Um, I'll never get to see one, let alone drive one. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't care. I don't care. I think God had a hand in making it. And if he was alive, he'd be driving it. Everything about the Enzo is a statement, and over the years, this supercar is bound to become an absolute legend. Now, here's a good question for you. What do Jarno Trulli, Jean Alesi, and Michael Schumacher have in common? Apart from the obvious, you'll be surprised to know they all own one of these. <laughs> The Fiat 500 was introduced way back in July 1957 to replace the Topolino. And after Sofia Loren, it became one of Italy's greatest successes. I absolutely love the Fiat 500. I mean, I've always driven small cars such as minis myself, but I always hankered after a Fiat 500. I think they're just one of those things. The British public loves small cars, small, cute, cheeky cars, and how can you not love that one? The 500 was the first Fiat to have an air-cooled engine, a 479cc unit producing a massive 13 brake horsepower. It also had a four-speed gearbox. Fiat had high hopes for the car, but sales were initially disappointing. Pedestrians, they don't see, see them very often, so they stop and watch. Motorists, that they're, they're a lot friendlier towards you. They, like if you pull up at a junction, 
the, uh, the car might stop and let you out just so he can have a look at your car for a bit longer so he'll let you go in front of him so he can have a look. What really changed their fortunes though was the 500's foray into motorsport. In 1958 the sport version was introduced and in its first year it finished first, second and third at the Hockenheim 12 hour race. The 500 baby boom had really started. The Fiat 500 never became hugely popular in the UK um, simply because Fiat didn't bring that many in. Um, it was hugely popular, obviously, in Italy, um, where it just packed the streets and uh, Italian towns had narrow, you know, medieval streets and uh, you needed small cars. And the Italian nation wasn't very rich um, immediately after the war and into the 50s and 60s. So they needed economy motoring and the Fiat 500 just supplied it in spades. Between 1958 and 1975, more than three and a half million cars were sold. And almost 20 years on now, many are still on the road. The Fiat 500. I wonder how many of you watching this programme have owned one of them. Now, one more car to go in this section. Before that, though, let's recap on the last five. At number 86, it's the all-American Dodge Charger. At 85, the Ferrari F355. At number 84, the quintessential Caterham 7. At 83, possibly the best thing on four wheels, the Ferrari Enzo. Followed by another Italian legend at 82, the Fiat 500. And so we find ourselves at number 81. You know as well as I do that some cars are all about image, irrespective of their performance on the road. But just occasionally you find a car whose ability does match its image and one such car was the Ferrari Dino. The Dino is such a significant car within, uh, within the life of, of Ferrari, and they got it so right. Um, you, just, you look at that car for inspiration for every car pretty much that followed on. Powering the Dino was a 2.5 litre V6 engine. Performance, as you'd expect, was impressive. And even now, the Dino could embarrass quite a few wannabe sports cars. The introduction of the Dino was a mixed occasion for Ferrari. Although the company had once again built a truly impressive sports car, they'd also suffered a great loss. Tragically, in just his early 20s, Enzo Ferrari's son had lost his battle with cancer. And as a tribute to his son, Enzo created the Dino name. I think the Dino looks... Um... I don't think of age at all, really. I mean, the bulbous shape, I just think it's spectacular. The introduction of the Dino in 1969 followed on from a major power shift within the company. Despite being a successful exotic sports car manufacturer, Enzo Ferrari's overriding desire was for success on the race track. I was travelling in the car and uh, some people actually uh, bowed down in front of it, which is quite, uh, quite funny. The Dino is one of those cars that if I had the money, I would definitely have one in my collection. It's like the must-have car. They may only be numbers 100 to 81, but at least they made the chart, so good on them. And I hope you enjoyed the first of our five programmes looking at your 100 most popular cars. Next up, it's numbers 80 to 61. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.